saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be alive today, to be able to enjoy the privilege of coming. We ask that you to please lead us, lead our minds. We want to be able to understand better some of the ministerial difficulties that have faced your servant and other servants in the world. I ask that you would please bless us, that we will be able to understand best what it is that we can do to prepare for better and further ministry in this world. We thank you for this opportunity, asking for your blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> All right, give me the go ahead for to begin and I will do so. You are ready, uh, you are free to proceed. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm very thankful to be again in Kenya. I've been there three times already personally, the first time in Rongo and another time for a short weekend in that area and then also in Nairobi and a few other places, but it's been good. I was in Kisi as well during the first, the uh, third time I was there and it's been a real blessing. So I'm, I'm grateful to be alive here today and uh, able to interact with you. So. God bless you all. I, I can't see everybody only because I'm, I'm seeing something other than, there it is, I'm seeing you all now. So good to see you all and, and God bless you. I hope that we are able to uh, enjoy this time and be blessed. Now, ministerial difficulties. The only way I can come to this presentation is through my own personal experience. And having been a minister for many years in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I feel like I have a little bit to glean from and I also went through a book called Pastoral Ministries and looked at some of the subjects there and realized that there are some difficulties that everybody faces. And I've been able to relate some of those uh, topics or some of the headings to my own personal experience. And I feel like I can share a few things. Now, we're going to be able to look a few at a few Bible texts as well as I'm going through this, this topic. And here in the Ministerial Difficulties presentation, I can say that in the year 96, which is uh, 24 years ago or so, 25, almost 25 years ago, I became a Christian. And immediately I started walking with the Lord in a way that was going to help others understand what I had learned because the burden was on my shoulder to share with people as quickly as I could. And so my, my burden right off the onset of becoming a Christian was to share my faith. And at first I wanted to literally go up to people and just tell them without even meeting them or anything like Jesus is coming soon. You've got to prepare. But I realized that logically that wasn't going to work very well. So I was praying on how I could learn how to share and what to do and how to go about uh, being prepared. So God brought me to a school similar to what you're going into right now. I was given the opportunity to meet with other people from different places in South Dakota, United States, and we were able to uh, interact together in a way that was a great blessing for the first, uh, the first training I had was three weeks, and then that went on to some work in Southern, Cal um, yes, Southern California. I came back and was able to train for a full year in both uh, medical missionary labor, which was called um, Allied Health. And so that included massage, natural remedies, uh, hydrotherapies, various herbs and uh, natural medications. We learned about diet and outreach with evangelism through health. We read some books, et cetera, learned a lot of things about the anatomy and physiology. And so as a result of doing that labor, also pastoral ministries, I've been able to do uh, some education in this realm. But what I'm saying this for is that all during that time, I was involved in ministry. And so a lot of what I've learned has been just through the School of Hard Knocks because I didn't go through official training. And in some cases, we can say thank the Lord for that because 
that we have a good history of people that have not gone through formal education. For example, let's refer to John the Baptist. Let's refer to Jesus Christ. These people in the New Testament were not educated by the normal means of education during their day. So uh, if you have not been to school, but this is an education that you're getting in the realms of Christianity, then praise the Lord, you're on a good path. May God bless you in his service. And so the first thing that I noticed in my experience as a minister, a, a gospel minister, even before I was hired as a pastor, was that I needed to, without fail, I needed to be faithful in Bible study and prayer. And I'll tell you, that is one thing that I have noticed, even as a pastor in many churches. It's been seven churches. I've been at a school as well. I've been at a, uh, let's see, in various conferences and part-time pastoring in different churches in other conferences as well, where I wasn't the senior pastor, but I was helping. I learned that in many places, our saints, whether they be Seventh-day Adventist or in some other faith, our people do not know how to consistently stay in the Bible, in Bible study and prayer. They pray, many of them, but they don't study the Bible like they should. And they'll cry out to God, why, oh why, I'm praying and <coughs> God isn't answering my prayers. And you have to be very honest with these people. Well, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> are you answering his prayers? You know, uh, if you're not answering his prayers, why would you expect him to answer yours? He wants to spend time with you, right? This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And so God's desire is to spend time with you. And <clears throat> the Bible makes it very clear in the book of Acts, such as I have, give I thee, right? If you don't have something as a Christian, if you don't have something as a, uh, a Bible student, you won't be able to give it to that person. And so uh, who you're trying to minister to won't be able to receive what you hope to give them if you don't have it yourself. So like in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, we're going to read a verse here and see that Jesus Christ, <clears throat> a faithful student of the Bible, he was um, also in prayer early in the morning. You can see in Mark 135. Normally, I would share this with you on the screen, but because I'm not able to use my computer this morning, I'm just using my cell phone due to the lack of internet here at the house. I uh, am just going to refer to these things and read them for you. It says, In the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he, Jesus, went out and departed into a solitary pray place. And there he prayed. Well, so we know that Christ was a very dedicated student of uh, the Bible, but he was also a man of prayer. Thank you. There it is. And so as we uh, can see that he rised up, rose up early in the morning, we know that he was also a Bible student. And we can see if you want to go to the next verse, it's in 2 Timothy 2.15. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2.15 shows that we also can um, not only follow Christ's example, but we can also follow the example of the apostles and the elders. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, there are many references I could bring up in regard to studying the Bible and being prepared for the day of service, but I'll just hint on a few of those uh, concepts. In Exodus 16, you know that the manna fell from heaven. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Well, in Exodus 16, if you were unable or unwilling to gather the manna in the morning, what happened by the end of the day? You didn't eat, your children didn't eat, your wife didn't eat, and everybody's unhappy. But if you, as God had directed, got up early in the morning and you spent your time gathering that manna, you spent your time in prayer thanking God for the bread that he had sent from heaven, then certainly you will be able to feed yourself and your family, your wife and your children, etc., and everybody's happy. So. 
the idea of manna falling from heaven is a very good example for us to follow in being able to gather the bread from heaven in the morning. Now, there's another one in Ephesians chapter 6 where you see that the um, armor of God is given for those that are willing to wear it. Well, we know that the helmet of salvation is given to anybody who believes. Well, what is, uh, where do we get salvation from? Well, salvation is something that we get from the word of God. Okay, that's where we find out about salvation. What about the breastplate of righteousness? Well, righteousness is found in the word of God. Same thing with the belt of truth. Truth is found in the word of God. Well, there's the shield of faith, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We also know that uh, the, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The word of God. And then it says in the next verse, verse 18, praying always. And so Bible study and prayer is extremely important for the minister. Whether you, you are male or female, you can minister to people in a way that those who are willing to receive will be blessed. Now, um, I'm not referring to females being ordained. Don't take what I just said as going that direction because I don't, you, you, you may have known that I have spoken up quite a bit about that in the past. And I just believe that the, the Lord has called men to be ministers, but women can minister to many people. That's what I'm referring to when I'm saying that. I just have to clarify because somebody's going to throw a knife at me as, as a result of saying that. <laughs> so you have to be careful. So now the idea of Bible study and prayer, if we don't have Bible study and prayer in our lives, we will not be those that have life eternal. Okay. The Bible says, as, as we know about in John 17, verse three, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If you don't spend time with God, how will you know God? If you don't spend time reading about what God has said about himself, how will you know about God? These concepts seem simple, but they are extremely important. You see, we can be born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 23. That's life transformation. Let's go ahead and bring that one up, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, and we'll be able to see that by the word of God, we can be born again. And if we're not born again, what spirit are we bringing to the world? So 1, Timothy, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. So being born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Of course, we know the word is Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. But here, we know that the word of God in our hands, the Bible, this is what God is referring to as well when he's referring to the word of God that we can be born again by. It lives and abides forever, and we can have that as, as much as we are willing. <clears throat> and as Steps to Christ says, it is far better to go over one verse and understand it the best that we can compared to reading a bunch of information just so that we can say that we've read. Black on white, like black letters on white paper is not going to help you at all. But if you understand the concepts behind what God is saying in those words, and if you're interacting with your mind, with his mind, through the ministration of his agents that he sends to help educate us, then we are then being transformed into his image. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which of course was the mind of the Father. And how do we get that mind? Through his word. Now, just a very basic example. <clears throat> I'm speaking words right now. Those words don't come out of my mouth starting from my mouth. Those words come from my mind. My, the, the, the mind is an expression of my brain and the life that God has given me. Because my mind has these thoughts, my mind is able to command my mouth to speak these words. <clears throat> and so the words that you get, the words of God right here in the Bible, these words come from the mind of God. And if your mind is in concert with this word, your mind is in concert with the mind of God. You have the mind of Christ. And so that's where all of this uh, comes from, is transformation, being born again from the mind of God, from the words of God, from those words or thoughts that he has given to you 
in the Holy Bible. Now, if you go to somebody's house and you haven't studied and prayed, you don't have your heart and mind submitted to the mind and heart of the Father and His Son, then you are bringing a different spirit. There's no other option. You're bringing your own spirit, which has been influenced by the spirit of the world, which is Satan. And so the concepts behind Bible study and prayer as a ministerial difficulty, I think, are foremost. I think it's the first thing we must understand. If we do not have a regular, consistent, habitual life in Bible study and prayer, you should find another job. You should not be a minister of God. You should not go out and visit and share flyers and try to preach or try to study the Bible with people. If you don't have your own personal interaction with the Father and His Son, the fellowship with the Father and the Son, as it says in 1 John 1, 3, then, as I said, go find another job. You're working for the wrong person, which is Satan, okay? So I think this is really important. Now, there's two things that we can remember, two good statements, and they're worldly statements, but they're helpful, right? It says, people don't care what you know until they know that you care, right? So if you have had a life transformed by the Word of God, <clears throat> and you want to share with people because you have an unselfish spirit, they will know that, and they will respond. To Another one is this. Don't get so busy about the work of the Lord that you forget the Lord of the work. Sometimes, and I've met <clears throat> even ministers this way, they get so busy with answering phone calls or emails or messages or uh, responding to people that are appealing to them to come and visit, whether they are sick in the hospital or whether they need to study for this or that, or they're uh, late on their taxes, whatever. You can get so busy doing things that you forget, like um, Mary, to spend time at the feet of Jesus. And this is what we need to do. We must have every single day, every single day, needs to be committed to the Father and His Son first, first thing in the morning, and then, of course, His Spirit will be with us throughout the day. Now, <clears throat> I've already mentioned that uh, what we have is what we're able to give. If you have the Spirit of Christ in you or the mind of Christ in you, you will be able to give the mind of Christ. Like, for, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but I was supposed to be scheduled earlier um, in the morning for me, but I appealed to Zadok. I said, brother, please, you, you've set me to be starting at 5 a.m., which means I will get up at 4 a.m., to be able to uh, study and pray before I get onto this presentation, just because I don't want to wake up and then all of a sudden I'm here as some kind of mega Christian without having spent time with the Lord. And he was merciful in giving me this time where now it's eight o'clock in the morning for me instead of five o'clock. And so I've been able to get up and spend time in prayer and study. Now, why that's important to me about not getting up at four is because if my, um, constant clock of sleeping at 10 and waking up around 5 30 or 6 if that's shifted then it messes up several days for me and my mind isn't as clear and I'm, I'm just frail that way I need my sleep and if I get good sleep then I have good clear thoughts and so Zadok thank you for allowing me to, to have a little bit more time to sleep in to be able to prepare for this and uh, be spiritually prepared for this morning and so it's important that you find opportunity to take the time to spend in Bible study and prayer consistently. If you don't, please go find something else to do in your life. You are not working for God. It's that important. And I think we need to understand it. So now, <clears throat> if we have the Spirit of Christ, we should be able to have like what Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says. We should have the fruit of the Spirit which is love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, and temperance. If you don't have those things in your life, perhaps that should be part of your ministry, is focusing on how God can change your life. There are ministers that I know of that are very short-tempered. I know of one man who said that, he told me this personally, so I'm just relating his story. He was in a minister's meeting, 
and there was a guy who he felt very good and was happy and so he was laughing and he reached out and grabbed his leg and when he grabbed his leg he squeezed it which was ticklish to this man that was telling me the story and this pastor he said hey please don't do that and he moved his hand really quick and was kind of forceful but the guy you know he didn't recognize that he was serious uh, so they were both pastors by the way so this pastor grabbed this other pastor's leg who told me the story and so this other pastor he started uh, laughing again and he grabbed his leg the same pastor that told me the story he grabbed his leg again and he pushed his hand away he said i told you to stop that and so because this pastor that was telling me the story he didn't like to be tickled he had some brothers when he was younger and they would force him down on the ground and would tickle him and it would really frustrate him okay and so the third time this other pastor he could see that you know this pastor that told me the story was kind of getting upset and so he did it again he, he said yeah isn't that funny and he grabbed his leg and squeezed it and the pastor that told me the story he was kind of ashamed at this but he was giving me a real situation in his life he told this guy he says hey come outside and they both walked outside together and this pastor was the the one that tickled him he was still laughing and uh so the one that told me the story he told me that in the minister's meeting with the president of the conference okay they walked outside those two pastors and the one that didn't want to be tickled he turned around and punched him in the stomach really hard knocked the wind out of him and he, he fell to the ground and <clears throat> I just want to tell you that that was a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's still alive. I know his name. I know where he is. And that's what he was doing or was able to do as a minister of the gospel. And so you wonder, like, how do we get to that point as people that are Christian? Well, if you haven't figured out what God needs to transform in your life through Bible study and prayer, and if you haven't reflected on the fruit of the Spirit, <clears throat> then you may just have something in your life that would expose itself at the wrong time and in the wrong place. Now, because the pastor that hit the guy, the other pastor in the stomach, was able to apologize and recognize that what he did was wrong, the other pastor never told on him. So it never got out that this scenario had happened at a minister's meeting. <clears throat> but the reality is it did happen and we can find ourselves in very strange situations as those that believe as Christians if we're not careful so if you haven't reflected on your own life like what makes me walk away from God whether it being frustrated or you're eating too much or you're watching the wrong things or you you speak too much about other people or you know, there's a whole list of things I can go through if you haven't seen your own experience compared to the experience of Christ recently, maybe you should spend some time in, in prayer asking God to reveal to you what may be in your future the ministerial difficulties that you will personally go through. Because God will bring these things to light. He will ex expose them in your life. And so uh, there was a time where I, as a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, was dabbling with things I should not be, okay? And it, I wasn't like full, full sail in the depth of sin, but I was, I was dabbling with it, okay? I knew it was wrong, yet I still was dabbling with it here and there. And it brought me to the point where my family was not doing well, because of our interactions with one another and i won't get into the details of the story i'll just let you know it's a real thing i came to the point of nearly committing suicide in the seventh day adventist church as a pastor and i was already ordained i already uh, was working full-time had churches that were under my direction etc but because i was dabbling in sin Little by little, the enemy was able to bring me to a place where, in my personal experience, I almost took my life because I realized that I had messed up, I had failed. Not only had I failed God, I had failed my family. And those two things are very important to me, my family and my God. Those two things are very important. And so when I felt like, because of the choices I had made and the allowance that I had um, 
given to bringing things into my life. Because those two things I felt I had failed, I almost ended my life. Now, I don't know if you've been there or not. It's not a good place. But you wonder, how do you get there? Well, of course, the way that it's by going contrary to God's will. And so if you as a gospel minister, if you're wanting to do service for the Lord, you have got to repent of the things that you know are wrong. Bringing up another verse, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Maybe I can bring it up. I don't know if you're able to do that or not. I can't do it on, on your screen here, so I'll just do it locally. There it is. You're doing it. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. It says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So this is not God's fault. You know, my experience as nearly committing suicide as a pastor was not God's fault. That was my fault. Those were my choices that brought me to that point where I felt like there was nothing that I had worth living for in this world. You know, I, I didn't, like, like many people, ready to commit suicide. And this is something you should know. People that are ready to commit suicide, they don't want to die. It's not about wanting to die. It's about not wanting to live. Okay, if, if you've never heard that, you need to understand it. Suicide is not about wanting to die. It's about not wanting to live. And there's only one other option, dying, right? So that's really what it was for me. I didn't want to live anymore. I didn't want to keep messing stuff up. And so uh, the idea behind keeping your life in concert with the Father and His Son as a minister, as a worker in the gospel, is extremely important. If not, you're working for the wrong team, and you should go and find something else to do. Now, just because you have fallen once or fallen twice, you've made a bad decision here or there, does that mean you should give up the gospel service entirely? Absolutely not. No, we all make bad decisions. We all make mistakes. But if you're going to choose the devil over your Lord, then go ahead and serve the devil. If you're going to keep doing it, then go for it. You know, that's what God is saying in the Bible. They're saying, he says it many times in different ways. And so depression or grief or anxiety or all those mental experiences that come upon people they can be dealt with, but I'm telling you, it's got to be through Bible study and prayer. And so a lot of these things uh, can be understood in that the Bible makes it clear in Romans 3.20 that the uh, sin is to be made known by the law. Okay, Romans 3 verse 20. You can read it there. <clears throat> It basically says, by the laws, the knowledge of sin. That's what I wanted to, to say. And so instead of going there, perhaps you can go to a different one. First Timothy chapter 1. There it is. First Timothy chapter 1 and verses 9 through 10. First Timothy 1, 9 through 10. You see, if you are a righteous person, you should know this that the law is not made for a righteous man. You know, the, the law doesn't point out sin in the life of a righteous man. But you just read earlier in Romans 3.20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so if your life is in concert with God, then the law doesn't condemn you because you are, as in the sight of God, you are as righteous or justified as his son. But it says here in verse 9, it's for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinners, and for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and mothers and, and the manslayers, for whoremongers, or for those that are on the internet, those that search the wrong thing on the internet, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. 
So the law is definitely something that's helpful for us. If you are condemned by God, then go search that thing out. What is it that condemns you? What is it that you are guilty of? Then find those things out. Search those things in the Bible. Why is it that I'm guilty of this? What does the Bible say about that? When you learn about those things, you will know and understand. And uh, God will give you a great opportunity to um, repent as a result of what he says in his word. Now, sometimes as, so I'm, I'm going beyond now out of the uh, mental struggles that some pastors can have. <clears throat> what about submission? You know, uh, there are a lot of people in a lot of places. In fact, I know of elders right now, today, this very day in Kenya, that they will submit to the church, they will submit to their pastor, no matter what the Bible says. And it's really frustrating, actually, because we, we want to be submissive. We want to be, you know, uh, kind and loving, but submissive when and to where? So sometimes submission is really important, but the most important submission is to God. Now, there, were, there was a time in my experience where the, uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the conference president came to my house, and it was because he was visiting everybody's house. Every minister in the whole conference, he was actually visiting their home. Well, now it was my turn. And I told him that I had been studying about this concept that really troubled me because I'm doing ministry wrong in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I told him that hovering over churches and doing ministry the way I am and the way that all the other pastors around me are doing it is actually contrary to God's will. And I was hovering over churches. And I explained it to him from the writings of Sister White and from the Bible. And he appealed to me to actually stay in the church to be able to uh, bring about this ministry in the, the local church. I'm sorry, I'm, I got a call there. I don't know if that messed up the internet or not, but anyways, I'll continue going on. I, uh, I was appealed to by the president, and he said, I want you to bring what you're learning into your district so that it, it can be contagious and it will be... Um, followed, the example will be followed by other workers in the conference, because he could see that what I was saying was true. He had done that study, and he wanted it to be a ground-up movement instead of a top-down movement. What, the, what he means is he wanted the churches to start it, and it would infect the churches so that the conference would accept the idea. It looks like your power went out over there. Is that true? Are you still connected? Let me know. I, I want to be able to wait in case. I'll wait to hear from you. Yes, you are faster. We can hear you. Okay. Should I just continue on then? Yes. All right. Thank you. And so what we have going on is that uh, while the president of the conference was at my house, he appealed to me to stay there and to do the ministry. Well, I was really praying hard. I was praying really hard. In fact, the next week, because he, he appealed to me, he said, please pray for a week. I don't want you to go. I want you to stay here. And I want you to pray for one full week. Pray whether God would keep you here or would bring you into something else, because I explained to him I wanted to do a digital ministry instead of the local pastoral ministry. And so I'll tell you, I prayed more in that week than even when I was preparing to get married. I, this, to me, was huge. I mean, listen, I was praying a lot about getting married, but it was more of excitement, and I was praying kind of out of joy and excitement, and I was praying about every single thing when I was going to be uh, married, but in this case, when I was uh, praying about whether to stay in pastoral ministry or not, I was giving up not only the life that I had as a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but I was also giving up some of the, um, how would you say, some of the very nice things for my wife and my, my family. Um, when you are a pastor, 
you have a good paycheck. You can have a nice home. You have good insurance. You have, you know, uh, lifelong work. I mean, I could still be a pastor in the Seventh Day Adventist Church if I didn't ruffle any feathers. And, um, but I was praying hard, like, Lord, my life is going to be redirected here. What's your plan? And so, what happened was that God made it very clear to me in that week that if I were to continue on as a pastor in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, I would meet the same kind of resistance in the local church that I had already been meeting and I would become discouraged. And so um, that's when the Lord led me. So now this submission idea, um, do we submit to the conference because they are quote unquote, the voice of God, or are there times where they're not the voice of God, right? And I know, and I understand that that minister, the uh, president was not a representative voice. He was, it was just his voice speaking to me, but the, the concept is the same. Do we follow our leaders in the church just because our leaders in the church said something? Or, as it says in James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, which I'll bring up here in just a second, James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. So, submission, according to James, Submit your, yourselves, therefore, to God. Now, God may be using somebody to help you understand what you should be submissive to. But sometimes God gives you your own mind, and you can choose the thoughts that God has placed in your own mind. Like, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, how do you resist the devil in this context? Well, it says in the next verse, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. So if you draw nigh to God, you will be resisting the devil, okay? So if you're wondering about what to do in your life, and you have some people that are telling you, no, 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 you don't want to go with the One True God movement, you don't want to do ministry in that group, no, you don't want to start teaching those things because, 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 that you might have all sorts of voices speaking to you, but what is God saying? That's what's important. We need to understand that God is the one that will give us clarity in our lives, and he will instruct us and bless us and deliver us in any situation that we find ourselves in. Now, I want to also go to another verse. It's in Acts 5, <clears throat> 27 through 29. Acts chapter 5, 27 through 29, which reads, when they had brought them, so they being the leaders of the um, church at that time, when the leaders of the, of the church brought them, which would have been the apostles, they set them before the council. Now, this is the church in session, right? And it says, they brought them before the council, and the high priest, this is like the conference president, he asked them, saying, didn't we, as the church, God's voice on earth, if you will, didn't we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem, you know, where God had placed his name. You had filled Jerusalem, the general conference, with this doctrine. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the apostles answered and said, what? We ought to obey God rather than men. And I so appreciate the apostles' example in this setting, where you can see the voice on earth, if you will, the voice of God on earth, and the apostles were saying, no, I do not believe that you all are speaking the voice of God on earth. In fact, we believe that God has commanded us to preach in this name. And so now, submission is good as a minister. You need to be submissive in the right context. You know, God didn't call Martin Luther to be submissive at his time. He called him to be a thorn in the side of the church. And God didn't call William Miller to be submissive to those that were telling him not to share. He was, I mean, in fact, he was trying to get him to share. I understand that. But there were a lot of people that were telling him, no, you're, you're teaching what was wrong. You also understand that the early pioneer movement was told that they're all wrong. This is contrary. You shouldn't be doing this or saying this. But they were not submissive to humanity. They were submissive to God. And as a result, the beautiful truth of the three angels' messages have been given to us since the, uh, so the previous 50 years of 1903, right? So we have so much beautiful information as a result of people not being submissive to man, but rather being submissive to God. 
and we need to follow their example. And so uh, good for you if you know the truth and you are unable to keep silent. That is a great blessing. And I hope to God that he will continue to benefit you in that work. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just glad. Now, if I today were to go back into being a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, would I stay there and keep the full-time job, the good pay, the benefits, and the, kind of like, a, in many cases, a very relaxed job? You can visit if you want to, or you can stay home if you want to, you know? Would I go back and accept that job again? Um, rather, would I, let me say it this way. Would I go back and stay in that position rather than be uh, where I have been led by God through some very difficult times, absolutely, with this movement of the one true God? Would I do it differently? The answer is 100% no. I would not do it differently. If I was a minister today and I learned about the truth about God again, having never known it, if I were to start over, would I counsel myself to go and share the truths that I learned? The answer is 100% yes, absolutely. Loud and clear, share what you know. God doesn't need people to be quiet today. God needs people to speak up about who he is because there's a whole church that's in idolatry as a result of what's gone on and we need to call people to repentance. And so I would do the whole thing again, and I'd be glad to do it. So no matter what the organization says, if the organization is untruthful, we cannot follow any organization, whether it be a Revelation with Daniel or Gospel Sounders, or whether it be the General Conference or wherever, whoever, it doesn't matter. We need to stand alone upon the Word of God. And I think God is calling people to do that. Independent ministries can be tough. They can be very difficult. I know that. Uh, if you haven't yet, as a ministry, Gospel Sounders, if you haven't yet, you are going to meet some very difficult times. The people inside and the people outside are all going to be very difficult to interact with. And that is part of a ministerial difficulty, dealing with people, right? I, I used to say a lot in, jo in jest, but it was actually very honest as well. You know, I love being a minister of God, except for the people, right? So, um, you know, God's church on earth can be very tough. Uh, no matter what part it is, maybe you feel like you're in like the ministry that God has called for this time in earth's history. Well, the devil knows that God called that ministry uh, to be on this earth at this time. And the devil's going to do everything he can to work into that ministry and to mess it all up. And so we, we've got to be careful that we don't think that where we are is like protected from the weeds and the bad seeds because the enemy is scattering his seed as much as he can everywhere he goes, just like the Lord has called us to do, right? So good seeds and bad seeds are all over the earth. We need to recognize that in the ministry, we're going to meet those difficulties. And, you know, it, it doesn't help to go bad mouth those that have done evil to you. In my case, I have been very careful. I have tried very hard to only speak what I need to about those that have done wrong to me. Um, you know, because it's, it's me. They've done wrong to me. Hey, so what? When they do wrong to God, that's his business, and he'll take care of it. So, you know, there, there are times where I have, and I will have to speak publicly about what's gone on in certain situations, but I don't speak unnecessarily about people or ministries. And I think you can take a good uh, lesson from that, not just from me, but from others that have done the same, because we don't need God's people to have more chaff to spread around about each other. What we need is more unity. And so if we can humble ourselves and not please our inner demons to be able to share those evil things that somebody did to me or to them, then don't share them. You know, just, just pray about it. If you pray more than you share about somebody's evil deeds, if you pray more about that person compared to sharing, then good for you. But if you share more about their evil deeds compared to how much you pray for them, then shame on you, right? And so now, service in whatever capacity is training. And that service that God has called you to, that's difficult. You know, sometimes knocking on doors for me as a minister before I was a pastor I was doing Bible, um, 
what is that called? Uh, Bible work. Here in America, it's called Bible work. You're a gospel worker. You're paid very little as a salary working for a local church or a, a series of meetings or a conference. I was at that time working for a conference, the Northern California Conference. My job was to knock on doors full time. And I'll tell you, it was very, very difficult to do. Knocking on doors and interrupting somebody's day is actually not my favorite thing to do. Um, I don't like it when people interrupt me if I'm busy doing something. It's just, that's just who I am. It, it doesn't make me frustrated or anything. I just would prefer that they would let me know ahead of time, like, hey, I'm going to stop over or whatever, right? And so if, uh, if I'm that way, I kind of push that same kind of reaction on other people. I always feel like if I interrupt somebody, then they're not going to like it very much. And I don't like to cause people um, discomfort, right? And so, except when it comes to the truth, then I'll, you know, I'll share if, if I certainly have opportunity. But <clears throat> I had to go contrary to my own personal desires. I did not want to knock on a hundred doors in a day. I didn't want to go and you know, walk down that road and knock on that do all those doors that looked like they were either very wealthy people or very poor people. I didn't want to bug them, but I had to go, go contrary to my own will, and I had to force myself to follow what I knew to be my job. And I think that is a very important thing to do. We have been given opportunities to learn in the school of practicum, if you will, practice, ministry. If God has called you to work with somebody who's ill, but it's kind of gross doing it, do it with diligence. Do it with honor. Do it for the sake of Christ. If you've been called to preach, but it's really scary and you don't like being in front of people, then by God's grace, prepare ahead of time and preach in front of your family or the mirror a hundred times before you do it in front of that group. Do it and do it well. If you've been called to distribute literature, but you don't like to because you're too afraid, do it anyways and believe that God will bless your efforts. These, the, the fears that we have are not from God. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of soundness of mind. And so we need to be able to understand that God has called us into service for the sake of ourselves, not just those that we're ministering to. So service many times can be a ministerial difficulty. You will be brought into scenarios where you do not want to be there. I have been behind pulpits that I do not want to be behind. I have been in front of people I don't want to be in front of. I've interacted with people on the street or at, in people's homes where I don't want to be there. But you've got to continue to walk where God has called you. As long as you believe God has called you there, then do it well. But there are some times, of course, where you just need to turn tail and run because uh, <clears throat> maybe he hasn't called you there. And so, you know, in this training of ministry can be extremely difficult. Think of Elisha following Elijah. Elisha was, you know, he, he followed and he was asking questions and he wasn't getting the answers that he wanted. And he just was told to follow. And it was kind of a humble thing. Well, after he followed Elijah for a while, and then Elijah was taken, we can see that God really blessed the spirit of Elisha. In fact, what's interesting, maybe you don't know this, but Elijah worked a series of, I believe, seven miracles, okay? Elisha started following Elijah, and when Elijah left into heaven, Elisha prayed, Lord, Give me a double portion of his spirit. And that was his request. And, you know, Elisha, Elijah had said, well, if the Lord allows you to see me going up in heaven, then he's, you know, answered your prayer and then he'll, he'll be able to do that. Well, guess what? Elisha, he worked twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And he prayed for a double portion of the spirit. That does not mean that just working miracles means that you have the spirit. But it was proof that God had given him a double portion of Elijah's spirit because he was able to work 14 miracles. So I think that's really interesting. Anyways, Elisha started out pretty humble, but then he was able to be used in a great way, right? And so what about the 12 disciples? They had to walk for three and a half years with the Lord, and many times they were unrecognized. They were dishonored. They were looked down upon by the local church. They were, they were spit upon and, and you know pushed aside. 
and they were talked about behind their backs. They were embarrassed publicly. They were uh, rebuked by some of the elders and the leaders. But what did God do through those men? Wow, it was, it's amazing what God did through the ministry of those apostles that at first they started out humble, but then later they were really used and really blessed. What about John? John, the, the gospel minister, John, the beloved, he was one of those ministers and he ended up spiritually alone on the island of Patmos. Now there were other people there. He wasn't alone on the island itself, but I mean, who did he have vespers with? Who did he have, who did he have fellowship with on the Sabbath morning? Who did he spend time with in prayer? Well, very likely nobody, right? They were some criminals over there, and perhaps he had been able to minister to people while he was there. I'm not positive, but uh, he was there alone. And because God had brought him not only through incredible experiences in his ministry, but it led him to what he thought was being alone at the end of time. Now, what God prepared him to do on that island is the book of Revelation and gifting that to us. That's incredible. What, what an honor to be used in that way, not killed, because remember, they were trying to boil him in a, in a pot of boiling oil, according to uh, Sister White and also Fox's Book of Martyrs, but he wouldn't die. And so as a result, what did they do? They sent him to the island. And on that island, he was used to receive and write down the gospel of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. And he sent and signified it by one of his servants, the angels. It was Gabriel. And Gabriel gave it to John. And then now you have it and you've been blessed by it. And so no matter how you start, no matter what you do, no matter God, where God leads you, you could, by his grace, if you're faithful, you could be blessed and used of him in ways that are far beyond what you understand. Listen, there's times where I get discouraged. Now, not like, you know, tail between my legs and head down discouraged, but I wonder sometimes, like, Lord, how many people are being reached? I mean, can you use me more? Can I do greater things for you? Like, why is there so few? And I have to sometimes check myself and recognize that God doesn't always open our eyes to what he is doing because he doesn't want us to take recognition for our own work. He wants us to always give praise to him. There's times where I feel like, Lord, I'm doing so little. What I want to do more. Please help. And there's times I'm in prayer and I'm just asking God, have mercy, because there are so many perishing around us. But at the same time, I recognize that Elisha was used powerfully. The disciples were used powerfully. They started off meager. They started off little. They started off frail. But God was able to use them many times after they died in a way far beyond what they could even think or imagine. And so no matter where you're coming from, God is going to use you. Just be faithful. That's what God is calling us to do. Now, we can see that uh, sometimes it's really difficult in the experience of ministry where you can have, um, sometimes it's, it's hard to interact with people. Like, for example, you have Paul and, and uh, who was it? Paul and Mark, right? They didn't have a good time. Paul and, and, and Mark, they had uh, somewhat of a frustration with one another. Or was it Barnabas? I don't remember. I know Mark was included. And so, yeah, I think it was Paul and Barnabas. They, they split up because they had some very, you know, rough characters in that setting. And sometimes in the gospel ministry, you can't be friends with everybody. I just got a message yesterday where somebody who I know believes the truth very well, he had to separate from somebody else who I know believes the truth very well. And he said, I, I hope never to interact with him out unless I absolutely need to, unless God brings us together, because this is very difficult. Well, I know that. I know what it's like. And there are times where you're going to have to face people that are part of your growth experience. It's part of your ministerial difficulties. But remember, Paul got together with Silas and uh, what was it? Paul and Silas? Yeah, they got together and they did ministry as well. And they were blessed as a result. Well, later, years later, Mark was able to start working again with Paul. And I'm sure Paul and Barnabas were able to interact with one another. And 
and I was uh, we're thankful for that. But you can see that the um, even in the biblical examples, we have the experiences of men and women going through very difficult times. And so now, um, some people are worried about. Well, the church hasn't called me. I, I haven't been given uh, an official ceremony to show that I've been ordained as a local elder or a minister of God. What do I do? Well, there's in um, the 11th letter manuscript, manuscript 75 from 1896. It's actually paragraph four. I'm going to read it to you. It's something that Sister White had written to some of the workers. And she said, I want to tell you that I, what I know from the light as given me. So now this is being, this is referred to as light given to Sister White, okay? It has been a great mistake that men go out knowing who they went to Pitt Cairn as a missionary to do work. But that man did not feel at liberty to baptize because he had not been ordained. Listen to what this says. That is not any of God's arrangements. It is man's fixing. When men go out with the burden of the work to bring souls into the truth, those men are ordained of God even if they never have a touch of ceremony of ordination. To say they shall not baptize when there is nobody else is wrong. If there is a minister in reach, all right, then they should seek for the, the ordained minister to do the baptizing. But when the Lord works with a man to bring out a soul here or there, it says, and they know not when the opportunity will come that these precious souls can be baptized. Why? He should not question about the matter. He should baptize these souls. Thank you, you found it. And so that's a really good quote for us to be able to understand that if God has called you into service, then God has blessed you with an opportunity to know that you have been called into his service as one ordained for his service. Now, just a, again, a clarification. She does refer to when men go out, I know that women can do great services. Men, uh, women have not been called to be apostles. When men, women have not been called to be one of the sons of Israel. Okay, they're sons of Israel. They're the the sons of Levi. But men, women have an extraordinarily important service. Now, for example, when God gave the instruction to Mary on resurrection morning to go and tell the disciples, hey, I'm risen and I'm going to go and meet you where I told you about. That was the first sermon given about a resurrected Lord. And God asked Mary, a woman, to give that sermon. That doesn't mean he ordained her to be one of the sons of Levi. He didn't call her to be an apostle but he did give her the responsibility of preaching one of the most important messages of the, the Christian era. He's alive. I saw him with my own eyes. Okay. So God has given opportunities for women to share just as much as men, but God has called men to be in specific uh, positions of responsibility. That doesn't denigrate women at all, not even a little bit. And so don't feel as though I'm, I'm putting anybody down because that's certainly not the way. Um, now, just so since we're talking about females, it's important to, under, excuse me, to understand as ministers, both men and women, that we must be careful with the opposite gender. Now, what I mean is if you're traveling somewhere, you shouldn't travel alone with somebody else of another gender. Now, why? Well, because you're to avoid all appearances of evil, the Bible says. But also, we know that way too many people have been involved in uh, promiscuity and infidelity while they are ministers or workers in the gospel field. We don't need that to continue going on, especially in the One True God movement. We don't need those things. God's people have been called a harlot many times in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, in Jeremiah, way too many times, and Hosea as well. We don't need that to be brought into our own personal lives. So 
I suggest, as does the, the spirit of prophecy, to ride either alone or with a group of some sort. Two females and one male, two males and one female, that's fine. But we should not be caught in a place where people would be able to see or say of us, you know, I saw them together. And what were they doing together? I have no idea, but they were together and they were alone. Well, we don't need that. And so whether you're communicating, whether you're going on visits into somebody's home, whether you're traveling with recreation in the sanitarium that's being set up there in Kenya, men do not work on women. Women do not work on men. Let the women work with the women, let the men work with the men. Okay, I think we're all old enough to understand why. These things can be emotional, they can be uh, far beyond, especially if somebody's sick. You can, you can be like their savior, if, they're, if you will, that God is sent for this purpose and there's a love that comes about which is um, unnatural. So anyways, those things need to be considered and, and well understood. I'm almost finished here, so uh, get your questions ready if you do have any. I'd love to have conversation with you all. Personal health, the new start concept, that is extremely important. And trust me, you will be tempted as a minister in the gospel to neglect some of those health principles. I have, I'm a very habitual type of person. I have no problem starting up habits. Uh, by God's grace, I have no, no problem also breaking habits, and, and that's a good thing. But what, what I've done is, Every single day, I take a long walk. And the reason being is I spend time in prayer while I'm walking. And the reason I do that is because I live in the country and what I see around me is natural and it's beautiful. I can look up in the sky, I can see the birds, I can look at the, the surrounding dogs in the neighborhood and I can praise God for the sunrise or the sunset. And I spend time in prayer while walking. Well, I always say like Enoch walked with God, why shouldn't I, right? And so. I personally exercise every single day. I go to sleep at 10 o'clock at night. If, if I have to, I'll stay up, but I really don't like to. I like to try to keep a schedule. I eat two meals a day. I have water between my meals and lots of water. I always try to drink lots of water. I exercise beyond just walking. I try to uh, get fresh air every day as I'm walking, etc. I try to you know, keep myself clean, hygienic, etc. And so you need to as well. You need to build those habits so that you, your life is consistently healthy. So that if by chance you are called to travel and you miss several days of sleep, you won't get sick as a result. Your constitution is strong, it's built up. You need to know what kind of medications to use naturally. You can use hydrotherapy, hot and cold, or you, you know, lots of things you can do using charcoal and garlic and all the various vitamin C and D and Bs. And so those things should be something that you are intelligent about as a minister in the gospel, because you will find there will be difficult times brought about your body. You will have to go through some experiences where you won't be able to eat. I don't know how many times I haven't been able to eat because of travel. Plus, I'm allergic to some foods, and that makes it even more difficult. So, but you won't be able to eat. You won't get enough water. You won't be able to sleep well enough, etc. Like, for example, when I was in Kenya, um, <laughs> I, lo I lost a lot of sleep over there the first week that I was there. But, you know, hey, I was in the water for an hour and I started getting sick, but I didn't get sick. I just started getting sick. I ended up with a cough and that was it. But I, I didn't, you know, go down and end up having, a, you know, to lay in bed for three days. So praise the Lord for health. <clears throat> Another thing that you're going to find in the minister, the ministry, is sometimes you will become tempted with jealousy. I have a friend named David who is like an amazing person. He's got so many skills. And early on in my Christian experience, I was jealous of him. And I had to wrestle with that and realize and recognize that God didn't want me to be jealous. God created me to be who I am. And he's called me in a different direction than David. But I wanted to be like David because he was such a powerful tool in God's hand. Well, I later found out that I have a friend named Jason who was jealous of me. And so I was jealous of him. He was jealous of me. Who, know, who knows who was jealous of Jason? And so this, there's a temptation that goes around that we're not happy with who we are and what we're doing. We want to be like somebody else or do what he's doing. Well, I don't think God has called us to that. So just recognize that it is something that comes about, and it is definitely something that is going to be a ministerial difficulty if you don't know what's in your heart. And so now working with people is a ministerial difficulty. <laughs> um, we're working with volunteers. 
you know, not many people are paid to, to do gospel like in a church situation. If you call people to do evangelism or like in this training, for example, how many of you are being paid to go to this training? Well, sometimes our activities or our attitudes can reflect that we're not being paid to be there. We're just volunteers. Well, shame on you if that's the case. But, you know, you, as a pastor, you'd go out to encourage people to do a health series or an evangelistic series or distribution of books or we go to you know distribute everybody's addresses so that church members would visit other church members and that kind of thing there are so many people that act like volunteers they're not getting paid they're not doing it they've got too many things to do nope not going to do it and so just whether you're training or teaching or you're having meals or you're preparing meals or doing whatever it is You've got to understand you are working with volunteers, and that can be a difficulty in doing ministry. But you've got to preset your mind to recognize that not everybody's the same. There's always what's called the 80-20 principle. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people, and vice versa. 80% of the people um, don't do, but 20% of the work, right? And so you can go back and forth with this 20-80 principle. There's people that you can trust, and they will help you but there's lots of people that are just going to act like volunteers. And so uh, just recognize that that's a real thing and God is going to inspire some people, but he, it's hard to inspire everybody. Now um, acceptance is not something you will have in the gospel ministry. Christ was not accepted by the world. He was accepted by few and you will not be accepted by the world. You will be accepted by few. I have very few people that I can consider like really close best friends. They are precious. I love them, but there are a lot of enemies out there. And we need to recognize that God has not called us in this world to, to be friends or friendly with everybody. Well, we can be friendly with everybody, but we're not to be friends with everybody. There are, there are times where we cannot be associated with those that have a different belief system because it's dangerous. It's poisonous. It's those things that, are going to lead people to accept the mark of the beast rather than the seal of God. And so acceptance is something that you're going to have to work through, whether you're rejected or not. In fact, the Bible teaches in, um, I think it's Matthew 11, verse 1, if you wanted to bring that up. I think it's true, Matthew 11, verse 1. And it's actually what Christ did with his disciples. Matthew 11, verse 1. It says, it came to pass... When Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, why would he do that? Well, he's already said previously that uh, a prophet is not without honor, except where? In his own country. Thank you. You brought it up. A, God, a, a minister is not accepted except in his own country. And so, what Christ was doing here in this verse, he was bringing, after he had already told chapter 10 to his disciples, which is all about like, hey, they're going to mistreat you. They're going to not like what you're saying. Wipe the dust off your feet. Go and preach. Your wife is going to be against you. Your husband, your children, they're going to turn you into the judges and rulers, etc. All that was said in chapter 10. But then he says right here, it came to pass when Jesus made an end of commanding his disciples, uh, what he had just said in chapter 10. He departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Why? Why did he do that? Why didn't he lead them to the cities where they would be more readily accepted? Well, he brought them there into their cities so that they would learn about rejection. Rejection is something that we must accept as part of our ministerial training. It's something that we go through. It's just part of it. Christ went through it. God has gone through it for who knows how many years. And you're going to go through it too. And that was what Christ did in leading his disciples into their own cities so that they would be rejected and they would learn how to deal with it. That's a tough lesson, but it's a real one. And so finally, what I have here is family and friends. You must take time with your family. We are not called to save the world, but lose our children. I don't know, some of you may have children, some of you may not, some of you have just gotten married, some of you are just starting to raise children, whatever. That is extremely important. 
Yes, you can say no to some things because you have a family. That is good. It's okay. And in fact, it's encouraged. You can't just spend yourself on the world and not have time for your family. You will be really bummed if you get to heaven without your children, without your wife, or without your husband, or without your mother and your father. You need to spend time. They're part of your ministry. And so one of the difficulties is that the devil's going to cause you to be so busy with the work of the Lord that you forget about your family. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, jokes in the ministry, in the Seventh-day Adventist ministry, or in pastoral ministry generally. One of the jokes is to call a pastor's kid a PK, a pastor's kid. Oh, you know, I grew up as a PK. If somebody says that to me, I generally know what they mean. That means my father wasn't around very much. He traveled. He was at church. He was at meetings. He was in his study preparing for sermons. He was giving Bible studies. And, you know, I, I didn't even always see him for the mealtime because he was out, you know, uh, eating with others and feeding the poor and that kind of stuff. Well, a PK many times has a very difficult life. I know a lot of PKs that are pastor's kids that have gone into very uh, negative directions, very making bad decisions because of how by their father and their mother. Don't do that. Take your children with you if you need to go and treat them kindly. Don't just treat them like they're in the way. I know ministers today who are part of leaders of ministries that they treat their children like they're in the way. That is not how we should be with our children. And so uh, I hope some of these thoughts have been what can help you understand a little bit more about maybe your own experience and what you've gone through, but maybe it's brought up some questions. And so we still have some time. If you guys are interested, I'm going to have a prayer and then we can um, have maybe some questions or comments and clarification if perhaps I've misspoken. And then uh, we'll see what Zadok has or maybe Sammy, our dear brothers in Kenya, what they have planned for the rest of this time. So let's pray together and ask for God's blessings on our further interaction. Lord of heaven, I want to ask that you please continue to lead us. You have called us all to do ministry, some in smaller ways than others, some in greater ways than others. Whatever it is, there are some of the lessons that are similar for all of us. We need to spend time with you. We need to spend time with our family. We need to recognize that our hearts can be evil. And there are situations that will bring those evil experiences out of our hearts. And we pray that you would help us to know and understand how to interact with ourselves. Give us the open eyes, the eye sap, to be able to know where our hearts have some things wrong with them so that we can prepare for interacting with others. I pray that if we are guilty in any way, if our lives are contrary in any way, that you would please break us from our sins, help us to break those things off of our experiences and to surrender to you and you alone. We know that you have power to keep us from falling. You've demonstrated it in the life of your son. So we pray that you'd help us to have that same mind in us, that we can walk the same path that he has walked and continue your life here on this earth. We thank you for this opportunity and pray the blessings upon our questions and comments now in Christ's name. Amen.